deep breathing and deep awareness that we are connected more deeply than we can ever imagine. Strong and gentle God, you have invited us to be connected as one forever. You've invited us in the past and now each moment today, each moment in the future, to be aware of how we connect with one another, how we either support or tear one another down. We pray that we will have the skills that, that are available to us, that will enable us to be facilitators of love. So that we will let the flow of love, your love, flow through us and make the circle complete. And we pray this in the name and in the power of Jesus, your Son and our brother, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hey, let me turn off my little thing here so we're not. Okay, well, my name is Joachim Lally, I'm a Paulist priest, and I'm very happy to be with you and, and be able to share something that is very uh, transformative for me. It has been for many years. And so let's just go around. We want to make sure everybody is recognized and start over here. I'm Jamesy B. Croft. Jamesy B. Croft. Cammy Mann. Cammy. Nick Capasso. Okay. Kurt Fadwa. Ray Ferris. Tim Allard, St. Thomas Church. Mary Beth Hanson. Patty Vandenberg. Barb Howard. Diane. Diane. Michelle Corn. We don't get, we know Irene about that. Bob, Bob Blanchard. Norma Blanchard. Margot Dean. Ruth Matoni. You know who I am. Dominic Matoni. <laughs> not everybody's privileges, I am. Oh. <laughs> Dominic Matoni. Joel Whitty. Annette Whitty. Jim Redding. Michael 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 Redding. Oh, two Kates in one person. I know. Oh, it's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Marcia Roseberg or not, but um, he has written this <coughs> tremendous book called Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Uh, create your life, your relationships, and your world in harmony with your values. And I had the privilege of taking a, I think it was a weekend workshop with him, uh, back in the early 70s in St. Louis. And uh, it had such a transformative effect on me that I have been teaching this uh, ever since then, in Boston and New York and, and Michigan and so forth. So I, uh, I feel like a philanthropist every time I teach something like this because it's so rich. And I just feel like I can to keep all this to myself. i got to share it, you know. So here we are. We're sharing. We're participating in that which gives us life. Okay. And it's all about life. So. Um, there are some little, I ordered some of these on the internet and they were supposed to be here by today, they did not come in. So uh, I hope I'll have some available next week. It's called Communication Basics, an Overview of Nonviolent Communication by Rachel Lamb. And this is the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Uh, they have these centers uh, around the world and they have training programs to help people become certified presenters of the of the process, this communication process. So, um, I thought what I'd do is tonight to <clears throat> give you some of the basics, and then next week uh, we will do some practicing. All right, and um, so I hope you study up between now and then so that you'll pass your exams. All right. <laughs> and um, we'll see what happens. All right, so. 
make one. The very word communicate means to make one, okay? Uh, you have the word uh, uni, uni, which is one in there, and then come, which is part of the Latin with, to, to make one, to make one. Uh, I was just teaching um, the very one who coined the word oneing, Julian of Norwich. I was teaching uh, a class on her this afternoon out at Calvin College. And uh, so I'm teaching the mystics out there for the four Tuesdays in uh, April. So uh, today it was uh, Julian Norwich. Last week it was Meister Eckhart. So just kind of keep these things going because they're just too good not to share. All right? All right. So all people are ever saying are various forms of please and thank you. All right. Do you believe that? In many ways, I mean, it needs a little unpacking. We often know what we want people to do for us, but we often leave out this very important question. When people can truly connect with how their giving enriches, that's the key word, enriches the lives of others, they naturally feel joy in performing acts of giving. So it's about feeling joy by this kind of communication. Conversely, when people act out of duty, obligation, fear, guilt or shame, they often feel resentment and anger, and everyone involved misses out on the opportunity to connect compassionately. Once again, a nice Latin word, compassio, passion, passion, of course, you know, passion means with passion with someone, in a way that would enrich life. Once again, enriching life, okay? So, just to start out, I'd like for you to um, get your pencils and papers out and so forth, and just uh, write down um, an ordinary day in your life, okay? What you do when you get up in the morning and, you know, what you do throughout the day. And just mention all the things that you feel like you have to do, you know, from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Things all we right? have to do or the things we want to do? Well, that's, your, that's, <laughs> that's up to you. I'm just giving you those uh, guidelines, all right? A couple more minutes. I'm only to nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's 
stop for a moment and get a temperature reading and find out, now that you've written some of these things down, uh, how do you feel? Tired. <laughs> really? <laughs> Anybody else echo that? Huh? I got worn out writing all I had to get done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did anybody have a blank sheet? Almost. Almost? Almost. Okay. Well, I would give an A plus to the one that had a blank sheet. Okay. Because. There's only one thing you have to do, and that's die. And if you want to get technical, live till you die. Everything else is a choice. So if you even think in terms of what you have to do, you're going. If you just think in terms of have to, or must, or got to, or have, what is the version you want? The inevitable feeling will be tired. Why? Because we were born to be free. You've heard this song? Born free. Right? Mm -hmm. It's true. Why were we born free? Because if we were not born free, we could not fall in love. There's no such thing as forced love. It's the, you know, it's, if anybody wants to come up here and draw me a square circle, then I will explain <laughs> It's an oxymoron. You cannot do both. You cannot draw both a circle and a square. It's either or. Either you're free or you're not loving. And any sense of going through life out of obligation and duty is denying who you are. Dying, denying your identity as a free child of God. So, how do you activate this this freedom, huh? It's in various forms of the word choose. I choose to, I, I'd rather, this, you know, there's different ways of saying it. Uh, but it's getting over the point that you are in control of your decisions, not someone else. You're owning responsibility for your actions. I choose to do whatever I choose to get up in the morning. I think of that every morning when I get up. I choose to get up. Literally, that comes to my mind. And uh, I choose to dedicate the, the day to God's love. It's the very first things I do. And then I choose to do the ordinary things, the bathroom, the breakfast, the, you know, whatever. But I don't think in terms of have to. It's against my religion. <laughs> Literally, it is. Because when I even think in terms of obligation and duty, I am denying who I am. I am freely loved by God. and God loves me freely. I'm freely loving God back. God doesn't have to love me. God only acts according to God's nature, which is love. And in that sense, you're saying God has to, okay, you might be able to say that, but God doesn't have to do anything because God just loves. And that's our challenge too, just to love. Any, anybody still with me or you kind of <laughs> left the door here? Huh? I love work. <laughs> anybody uh, disagree? That's okay to do. <coughs> are you saying all of your actions then are, I mean, like breathing, for example? Yeah, right. you, you don't really choose. Well, that's automatic. You know, yeah. yeah. But I mean, so all of your actions are just kind of, just kind of flow from your being, or they flow from my decisions, my choices. Um, I choose to check the computer, I choose to prepare for a class, I choose to celebrate mass, I choose, what are you? But I'm choosing, and when I'm alive, I'm choosing. When I'm vibrantly alive, I'm vibrantly choosing. But I know what happens to me when I think in terms of I have to. 
Mm -hmm. oh, I've got to do this. I got to do that. I've got to. <laughs> I got to celebrate the seven o'clock mass. You know, I hate to get up there early. You know, and so I get up at the you know six thirty. Say, okay, Joachim, get dressed. You got to go over to the chapel. All right, get busy. If I do with that attitude, I'm going to walk in the mass, and I'm going to do it like this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. You know, Lord be with you. Mechanical. How many times do we see it? How many people see it? It's art. If you're a waitress at a restaurant, it's, hello, may I help you? I mean, there's no light, there's no dynamism, there's no spirit, there's no joy. These are attitudes that we develop over years. And so, uh, what I do is I, I have the red flag technique. Okay. I said I wish I had I wish I had some red ink here, but I don't. But red flag technique is when I catch myself, and you call to be a detective. When I catch myself thinking in terms of have to, you know, got to, must. A red flag goes up in my mind because I hear it. When I'm with people and they're talking in terms of have to and must, it stands out. It just leaps off the page. And it's all I can do to not interrupt and say, excuse me, do you really have to go to the store? Of course I got to go to the store. Well, what would you do? What would happen if you didn't go to the store? Well, I wouldn't eat. Well, what if you wouldn't eat? Well, I'd eventually die. And then what? You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> keep pushing people. Then what? Then what? Then what? A lot of them, well, you have to pay taxes. Come on, Father, if you don't, you know. Yeah, a lot of people don't pay taxes and they go to the prison, okay? But they choose it. You know, they choose it. They're free. All right? Okay. Let's move on with the bare text. Basics. Alienating language, language used that makes it difficult for us to remain connected to our compassionate nature. Our nature is God-given joy and love. That's our nature. That's who we are. Okay? It's all given to us. We didn't, we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We don't just uh, gain it. We just accept it and give thanks for it. Uh, remember the first two words about please and thank you? Meister Eckhart says if we only say one prayer, and that's prayer of gratitude, that's all we need to do. It's all about leaving thanks. I see you. Uh, sort of nodding on the head there, right? Yeah. You've heard that one yeah. before, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I pulled that one out. Did you? All right. In times when I couldn't pray anything else. There you go. There you go. Now, words that imply wrongness designed for the game, who's right? Usually comparative, diagnostic, and judgmental. Francis should, ought, good, bad, right, wrong, always, never appropriate, inappropriate, stupid. Okay. Some people, this is their main vocabulary. Mm -hmm. you know? And they're very frequently looking at you and putting you in, like, okay, stupid, uh, inappropriate, uh, you know, wrong. Someone once said that in, in a marriage you have one choice, to be right or to stay married. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just going over what was told me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, right? Number two, words that minimize choice and respect for others' autonomy, demands. For example, you must, you have to, these words usually guarantee resistance mm -hmm. and provoke rebellious or submissive responses. Mm -hmm. So both rebellious and submissive go against our nature. Our nature is to be free, to be uh, alive, to be vibrant, and to uh, have options. Okay? So, uh, what do you think of those two? Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. Anybody have any uh, I got a story. Yeah. Well, the other day, I have a friend who always says, don't shit on yourself. 
Miss Kate. <laughs> but um, well, I she got it from me. <laughs> I probably did. So I, but I was talking to a friend the other day, and she said, you know, we should go out to coffee. And I said, you know, Joe and I, since we've been talking, I said Joe and I are trying not to use that word. You know, what else could we say? I would love to go out to coffee with you. She goes, you know, that does sound different. It that gives you a different yes. feeling oh and. She said, I'm going to, she said, I'm in this habit of during Lent once a week to try to uh, disconnect from a, a bad habit. And she said, I think I'm going to try to stop saying that word, should, or, yeah. And it really does, it gives you, and, and we'll do it, we'll start to say that in our language and then we'll stop and just, how could you say it more positively? And how could you say it in a way that doesn't take away freedom? This it's joy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, the resistance part. How many people, in terms of losing weight or whatever, oh, I shouldn't, I should diet, you know. I really shouldn't eat that, you know. And, yeah. and there's this tug of war going, it's fighting, you know, resistance, you know. Instead of saying, you know what, I choose not to eat that, I want to eat this instead. There's this little great little book that's out, eat, no, what is it? Eat this, not that, or something yeah. like oh, that. Yeah. It mm -hmm. gives you alternatives. So, uh, but uh, there is built-in resistance to someone that is obliging you. Yeah. You have to do that. How many times as children, you have to go to bed. <laughs> and even though you were dying to go to bed, you would never admit it. <laughs> oh, I can't I stay up another hour? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's just this built-in yeah. resistance. Okay. And that's why all this insistence on the commandments is thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That's such a negative thing, my goodness. It's like, uh, let's go back to Mount Sinai and reword that, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I was on Mount Sinai one time in my life on my trip to the Holy Land in, in Egypt and the Mount Sinai. And uh, it was interesting because there were about 20 of us on the trip. And, and we got down to this hotel right on the base of Mount Sinai and, and they said, okay, now anybody who wants to climb Mount Sinai in order to be there for the sunrise, we get up at 2.30. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, what? And everybody, not everybody, but about eight out of 10 said, no way, I'm not getting up that early. I'm staying in bed. And I and about three or four others said, I'm going. This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance. I'm doing it. I did. I got up and I got over there and I found out I could ride a camel up through a three-quarters way for fifteen dollars, and I did that. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a great experience. But uh, part of my nature was saying, "Don't get up that early. You'll be so tired." But another part said, "I'm choosing to get up, and I'm so glad I did." Can you imagine those people that came back and what did you get you get up to Mount Sinai? Yeah. Oh no, it's too early. I didn't want to get up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They'll say they couldn't. Pardon? They'll say they couldn't do it. Oh yeah. You know, I, couldn't it was, it, yeah. It's, I couldn't get up there. That's yeah, what you yeah. I couldn't do it. I just yeah. couldn't do it. Really? Uh, why? <laughs> yeah. They won't even take responsibility for it. It's, no, it's, no, because uh, yeah. It's all a matter of awareness of our language that I always say, watch your language, watch your language. Because the way you speak affects the way you think. And if you're thinking in terms of limiting your freedom, it's going to take away you know, your freedom, your joy, your, your, your spontaneity. And so uh, language affects the way we think. So often we think your, the way you think affects your language, right? And it does. But look at the other way too. The way you think and the way you well, excuse me, the way you speak affects your attitude. <coughs> Basics of nonviolent communication. Oh, Kelly got some good little images for me here. I had asked her to fancy it up for me. All right. Who's gonna read this? Now alienating language continued. Number three, who's on it? I'll read it. All right. Words that deny one's responsibility for actions taken, example, 
I had to, the boss said so. It's company policy, just following orders. That's just the way it is. I had no choice. It's not possible. Anybody ever use that language? Mm -hmm. Yeah. United Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And certain religious churches, all right? Parents. That's just the way it is. You've got to do this. <laughs> yeah. Thou shalt not, thou shalt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Denying one's personal responsibility. Number four. Go ahead, number. Words associated with the concept that certain actions merit reward slash punishment. Example, he or she deserves. Oh, does my skin wrinkle when I hear that word. Deserve. I am convinced that there's certain words that are not in God's vocabulary. And I think top of the list list is deserve, merit, gain, earn. earn. Not God vocabulary, sorry. They couldn't be. They couldn't be. Because everything is gift for which we can be grateful. Because the ego likes this. Because this gives you control. There's, the ego hates unconditional love. Because you can't take any credit for it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of this bit of merit and gaining, earning, uh, it's first Half a life vocabulary. If you're familiar with with uh, Jung and his first half, second half life, mm -hmm. half a life vocabulary, which basically says the first half of life is your climbing the tower, getting your education, your job, and your family, or whatever it is that you're aiming for, uh, or nation, or whatever it is. And the second half of life is after you climb the tower, you jump off. <laughs> it's realizing that there's nothing up there. If you have ever seen that beautiful little book called uh, For the Flowers, what is it? Uh, Hope, Hope for, for the, the Flowers? flowers. Yeah, Paulus Press. You know, I'm not getting any commission here, okay. But it's one of the best selling books that they have. It's called Hope for the Flowers. And I don't, uh, Irene, do we have any copies out there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, at the moment. It's a great little book. And it's all about little, two caterpillars, one is named Stripe and one is named Yellow. And they're climbing, they're crawling around, and all of a sudden there's a huge mountain of, 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 of caterpillars. And Stripe says to Yellow, Whoa, what's going on? They're all climbing up there. What's up there? I said, I don't know, I guess we better check it out. So they start climbing, and as they do, one Stripe says to Yellow, you know what, I, I don't feel too good about this. I gotta, I gotta climb and step on someone else to get up, you know. Oh, that's okay. That's the way it's done. Okay, <laughs> just forget about it, you know. So you get up there, and all of a sudden, they reach and almost get to the top, and this someone shouts out, "Hey, there's nothing up here!" <laughs> <laughs> Another one says, "Shut up! Everybody else thinks there is downstairs." Okay. <laughs> 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 and so they say, "My guys is." So they climb down, and then they, of course, go into the tree and whip, uh, weave their cocoon and become butterflies, and then they fly up to the top and try to warn the people, hey, there's nothing up here. Go, go back down. And they're not recognized. What's that? They're not recognized. No, no, they're not recognized. Because they're butterflies. Because it's a transformation, and that's what we're all called to do, to be transformed into love. But you have to die first, and this is an instance where you can use the word have to because it's conditioned upon the result. If you want to live, you have to die. Okay? There's a difference. Then you have to die by itself. But if you, if you want to live, you have to die. If you want to get a degree, you have to go to college. If you want to, you know, there are these kind of things, okay? So it's not just write off no have tos. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, choosing our response, when we listen to what people say to us, we have a decision to make about how we will respond. Okay, this can be especially challenging when responding to hard to hear messages. What would be some examples of hard to hear messages? All of the above. <laughs> okay. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Criticism. Okay. What was that? Criticism. Criticism. Mm. Uh, you're a loser. Mm. Okay. <laughs> now, the, the, the two different words were used here, and let's look at them. One was the word criticism, and one was the word loser. What's the difference in the two? Criticism isn't really a put down if it's done right. Okay. It's a name name it's, calling. You're helping the other person. Exactly. Like name calling. Label. The loser is the label. Or it's a title, whatever you want to call it. But whenever you have uh, such and such, and any form of am, is, are, you know such and such. Joe is lazy. She is crazy. Whatever it is, you know. Those, those are titles or those are labels. And when you use them, get ready for a response because it automatically gives the person a ticket, a free ticket, to get angry. It's just like horse and buggy, you know. Horse and buggy. I know it reminds me of the little tickets I have here. I got from from Sue, Sister Sue, Tracy, you know. It says this is a free ticket. It's not good for anything, but it's just free. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, here it is. It's free if anybody wants to get it. All right. Says, I've got some more. I'm going. To Put some more up here. There, I, I've got more at home. What do those cost? <laughs> they. I mean, I have to look at the cost. Okay, you can't afford it. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> and you want to see my holy card? This is what yeah. I two years ago was my fiftieth, right? Yeah. It's my fiftieth ordination. I gave out these holy cards. You want to see them? Yes. Yeah. They're full of holes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love it. These are also free. So okay. So anyway, we are called to choose our response and not be have an automatic, you know, okay, some because you call me a name, I call you a name, you know? Tit for tat, right? That's all that's called transactional. When you say something and the other calls for the response from another automatically, it's called transactional. And Rohr says that God is not transactional. It's not tit for tat with God. Okay, you obey the commandments, all right, you get a free ticket to heaven, all right? And that's a good deal, huh? All right. Well, that's the way some people look at it, you know. I've got to obey the commandments and I do my part and I get up to heaven and I say, okay, God, here's my resume. I made all the commandments and I you put my tithe it. in the church and you deserve I deserve an entrance here and where's my reserve seat? Please. I'm in a hurry. All right? You'll be in the front row. No, I got a, I want a front row seat because I deserve it. <laughs> Can you imagine? Did I tell you that one about the, the uh, woman that, that died and went to heaven and God said, well, dear, uh, we have a new rule here and uh, you have to spell a word right. Really, that's an odd rule. Well, it's it's a little. It's this what you've got to do. You know, do you want to get in here or not? Okay, what's the word? Cat, C eight. She said, "Oh, that's easy, Key C eight. Oh, well, come right in, dear. Come right in." So she comes. So she's there a while. Saint Peter comes up and says, uh, "Excuse me, dear. Uh, I need to go and talk with God. Would you mind taking my place here? You know the rules. When someone comes up, you just ask them to spell a word, right?" 
She says, well, fine, okay. So she's up there. All of a sudden, her husband dies and comes up, right? <laughs> married for 56 years, right? <laughs> and she gets it. Well, dear, I hate to tell you this, but we've got new rules. New rules? I wasn't counting on this. Well, all you got to do is spell a word right. So he says, what word did you get? She says, I got cat. All right, that's not too bad. What's my word? She said, chrysanthemum. Now, any any responses? Blame the other person or blame oneself? The blame game, right? We love to blame because we are not excited about taking responsibility. Nonviolent responses express my feelings and needs, guess what the other person might be feeling and needing. Okay, this is a nonviolent response to an alienating response. It's your fault that we didn't win the ball game, okay? You struck out, all right? Blame, all right? Uh, so, how do you respond? You express your feelings and your needs, and then you guess what the other person is saying, because you cannot deal with a blaming label statement. You just can't. You know? You're stupid, that's all. You're stupid. How do you deal with someone calling you stupid? How do you relate to it? How do you respond to it? I don't know. I, I don't. I translate it. And that's what he's talking about here. Guess what the other person might be feeling and needing. You translate it into something that's doable and specific. Specific. Uh, well, I'm... Picking up, you're really upset that I struck out. Well, um, you really wanted to win this game, didn't you? You know, whatever. You know, you're trying to have some empathy there. You're not just saying, "How dare you?" You know, that gets nowhere. You know. So you're trying to guess what you're doing. Focusing our attention by communicating using nonviolent communication, we direct our attention to the feelings and needs that are alive within us, as well as feelings and needs that are alive. In others. We do this through honest self-expression and empathic listening. Honest self-expression, empathic listening. Now when I took, first took this course from Marshall Rosenberg in the, in the early 70s in St. Louis, he called it feelings and wants. And now he's changed through the years, he's, that's his right of course, to feelings and needs. What do you think the difference is in those two? Wants and needs. Wants sounds optional. Need sounds like it's necessary. Okay, that's one interpretation. Anybody else? Uh, anybody agree or disagree? There's something about needs that come from a deeper place. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was that? I think something when I like needs to me strikes me as it comes from a deeper place. Okay, Tim. Uh, wants might be desired, and needs mm -hmm. might be considered essential. Okay. And wants might be controlling. I want that. Okay, now, when I say, Margo, I want that, or Margo, I need that. Yeah. <laughs> what? Any different feelings? Uh -huh. In what way? His need is well. I think it depends, but but want is 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 a choice. And you I, don't think a need is a choice? I don't think so. No, okay. I don't. Right. Anybody I think, else agree or disagree? I disagree with that. All right, come on. I, I, well, I just think need sounds like you're. It's more controlling than want when you say it, honestly, mm. because really you don't need that. You just want it, but you're saying need because. <laughs> it sounds like an ego, false pride. Type. Not necessarily, because <laughs> no. you've got needs, one thing. There are certain things that we do need, but there are things that we want. Oh. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Maslow 
There's a little hierarchy, you know, the right. hierarchy of needs. There right. are basic things every human being needs right. to live and survive and exist. And one of those is the love, mm -hmm. unconditional love, acceptance. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we say things, we're blaming, we use all these alienating responses because something in us isn't being is it met. met. And we're not really being honest with ourselves and the other people. That those are needs. Right. And I, I don't I think there's a total difference between a need that kind of a need and a want. Mm -hmm. And oh. if someone says need when it's really a want, they're being manipulative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes. if they're not really in tune with their really strong inner basic needs, mm -hmm. then then they're you know, they they, they go to these secondary responses and but those needs are real. And they need to be acknowledged by that person and the other person, too. Okay. That's a good point. I think that uh, when you really get down to the nitty-gritty, though, um, need can be pretty narrow. I, mean, I need to breathe. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I both need and want to eat. Um, Wanting and needing both can be misconstrued as demands. I need this cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're maybe really saying is, I would love to have a cup of coffee. But you say, I need this coffee. I have to have it. If I don't have it, I'm going nuts. Demanding. You need me to have <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a lot of it is your interpretation and the honesty of the person expressing it. Okay? Um, now, uh, Martin uh, Rosenberg speaks a lot about the importance of not interpreting a want <coughs> as a demand. Okay? Now, if you hear me, when I say I'd love to, I want a cup, I want a glass of water. And if you interpret that as saying you have to get up and get me a glass of water, then you're going to have a different reaction than if you say, well, uh, I'm going there anyway, I don't mind getting you a cup of water. You see that difference there? Um, but one of our problems in communication comes when we interpret someone's wants and needs as something we have to do. Right? You know, the, you know I like the story of the uh, husband and wife sitting down watching television. Some of you have heard this before. And I need you to listen, all right? <laughs> so anyway. She says, okay, honey, it's your turn to get up and get the snacks. So uh, he says, all right, what do you want? <laughs> she says, I want an ice cream sundae. And I want vanilla and chocolate and strawberry. I can write it down. I'm not writing that down. I can remember that. And I want strawberry syrup over the vanilla. I want chocolate <laughs> over the chocolate. And I want pineapple over the whatever the other one was. <laughs> but you didn't write down. Uh, I, didn't write down. <laughs> I can't remember. So, write it down, she says. Oh, I'm not writing it down. And I want whipped cream and nuts and a cherry on top. Write it down. I don't need to write it. He goes in the kitchen. 15 minutes later, comes up, back out, and he puts down a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> She looks at it and she says, I told you to write it down. Where's the toast? <laughs> <laughs> I love that story because it gets both of them. Right? It's not just picking on one or the other. But what we, uh, a, a really important factor of all of this communication is hearing. What are you hearing? And what are you, uh, are you misconstruing what you're hearing? That means interpreting it. How do you avoid misconstruing 
what other people are saying to you, are expressing their needs or wants. How do you avoid that? Check it out. Okay. It's called It's called keeping your chalk on the uh, board. Right? Okay. All right. It's called clarification, all right? Because otherwise, you're dealing with fuzzy wants, fuzzy needs, uh, demand wants, and so on. So, one of the most important things you do in communication is to clarify. Rephrase. Uh, there's different ways of uh, translating, different ways you could call it, okay? So, let's go on here. The following four steps of the NBC model guide us in connecting with what is alive in us and others. Observation, let's read them together. Observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Okay. Now, who's going to read observation from me? With Zest. I will. All right. Stating clearly what a person is saying or doing that is or isn't enriching life without using words that evaluate, judge, label, analyze, criticize, and or diagnose. Okay. Observation. You can all observe that I am doing what? I am holding, I'm not at the point, at this present point yeah. drinking, holding I'm holding a cup. Okay. Now, if you were to use words that evaluate, what could you say? It's a good cup of tea. Okay. You're holding a cup nicely. All right. Holding it nicely. Hot drink. Okay. What else? You're shaking a little. You're drinking? I'm not drinking it. Right now, I'm holding it. How would you judge me? Just doing, uh, I'm holding this here. How would you judge me? Be, be careful. You're doing a great you know, job. Be careful you don't spill it and burn yourself. Well, that's not a judgment. That's a demand. Okay. You're showing off. Okay. You're thirsty? Okay. Why? You're okay. showing Why? off. I don't see many men who drink tea. Oh, okay. You're so that's not. Oh, 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 you're thirsty. Okay. Is that really tea in there? <laughs> Pardon? Is that really tea in there? That's a question. That's that's not one of the ones the label oh. Evaluate, judge, label, analyze, criticize, or diagnose. If you're thirsty, why don't you drink it? Okay. <laughs> I choose not to. And that's <laughs> You really shouldn't be holding that cup of tea so close to that keyboard because you might spill in it and ruin it. You shouldn't, therefore that is a what? A judgment. What about a label? What kind of label can you give me? You're a tea drinker. A tea toad. You're welcome. You must be Irish because you like tea. You all could say, well, you're pretty damn selfish. You're not sharing that with us. <laughs> he right? always does that. Yeah. You always drink in front of us. Yeah. You never know that? share. Don't even okay. offer us a cup. These are all things that pass from a sheer observation of only a cup <clears> to <throat> something much different. Much different <coughs> repercussions. <coughs> Feelings. Connecting with and expressing what is alive in us using words that accurately describe the emotions and sensations we are experiencing. Feelings. Feelings are very important. Uh, we have feelings constantly. 
We're not, sometimes we're not aware of our own feelings. A lot of times we like to judge what other people are feeling when they're not really feeling that way. You know? But we have feelings, one way or another. Expressing what is alive in us. See, that's the importance of the feeling. It gets your, your dynamic aliveness, okay? And actually describe the emotions and say, all right. Needs. Connecting with the met or unmet need or value that is the source of the feelings. Okay? The met or unmet need or, or value that is the source of the feelings. Okay, so... <coughs> If we get back to the observation that I'm holding a cup and I'm drinking and I'm not sharing it, therefore I'm selfish, okay, your feeling, because you've judged me to be selfish, is one of anger. You are not supposed to be selfish. You're supposed to share. That's one of the words, otherwise we could put it, that's not in God's vocabulary. Supposed to, all right? Let me translate it into God language. Uh, the unneed... The unmet need or the met need, uh, you're trying to connect with it. Connect with it. So that you're on the same page. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a four-step process here. Observe how you feel, what you need, and what are you going to do about your need. Request. Asking for that which would enrich life Request is not uh, a strategy to get people to do things they don't want to do or a way to manipulate or change people. Just look at those four and just kind of see what comes to your mind. Any questions, uh, disagreements, what does it say to you? What leaps off the page? Any of them? And under the needs? Yeah. What does... It, what does what what the needs or values? Can you explain that a little bit further? Okay, uh, a need might be uh, the person who's just said you're very selfish. Their need might be to put you down. Their need might be to put their self above you. But they may not be aware that they're doing it. You see, but it's like, what's behind your feelings? The observation can be rather neutral. I see that you're sitting there, okay? Pure observation. You get into feelings. The feelings are concomitant a lot of times with your needs and your wants. I would add uh, wants with needs because I think they're two, they have different nuances to them. <clears throat> and then the request. Uh, I personally, I disagree with Marshall in the, in the sense that uh, I I prefer the word want to the term need. I uh, I don't understand why he changed that, and he's he died a couple of years ago, so I've never been able to ask him. But that that's where I'm coming from. Okay. I, I have something. Yeah. I think we often project mm -hmm. where we're at onto other people. Mm -hmm. So. And what I found intriguing was that connecting with the met or unmet need. So sometimes our needs, are, when our needs are met, I think we evaluate or observe mm -hmm. more positively. So, for instance, recently I spent a lot, I was recovering from something, and I had to drink a lot of water. So I might have looked at you and said, "He's really taking good care of himself by hydrating during his talk." You know, when you talk, mm -hmm. you get dehydrated. Mm -hmm. okay. So. So I would be connecting with my met need of also hydrating and saying, oh, that's a really good thing he's doing, you know. In a way, you're still evaluating, you know, what, I mean, if I, I, I really had no opinion about what you were doing with the water, but, yeah, I mean, when we connect with our own feelings and sometimes we see it in a positive light because we have been, had our needs met in yeah, a positive that's way. That's a good point. Yeah, Joe. One thing that... Um, he puts in his book, Nonviolent Community, this is the third edition. <laughs> he put a list, and what I, I didn't realize in the culture, and it, this is the part of defining feelings and needs mm -hmm. that I had the most challenge with because when I think of it, and it's myself too, and it applies definitely to me and all of us in our culture, 
we a lot of times don't express, and you have, have referred to that or uh, were saying that, we don't think of our needs and we don't think of and speak in feeling terms. So the g good thing he does in this book is yeah. he gives He's got feeling a words huge there. list of these are all feelings and then he breaks down what he's defining as needs. And right. I don't know if it's in that, but and then he even goes to needs. You, you have a need for autonomy, for example. Right. To choose one dream, goals, or to celebrate the creation of life and dreams fulfilled, or independence. I need acceptance, appreciation. I might have a need for closeness or community. All of these type of words are independence, uh, you know. Uh, I have a need for empathy or honesty or whatever it might be. And that was very helpful to me in starting to try to sort out and still learn those words. Not that I don't know them when I hear them, right. but I don't use them, nor do I ever hear anybody else use them. And so we don't think and act. It's, it's a real transformation to give. To, it takes practice. It is. And, now, and one of the things here with a lot of you reading those need things, I think I could just as validly substitute the word want, you know. I want respect. I need respect. I mm -hmm. want, you know, a better job. I yeah. need a better job. Um, I think one of the reasons why people don't like to express their wants is they feel like, oh, that's going to sound selfish. I really don't have a right to say I want a cup of coffee. Would you mind getting it for me? You know, it sounds like I'm manipulating you, right? But we have a right to express what we would like for someone to do. And Lana, if we don't do it, we want them to guess what we want. <laughs> right? You should have known. You should have known that I was thirsty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know? Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying, you know, I, I get it, but I, I guess for me need isn't about something, a cup of coffee or, you know, a, a material goods or you know, praise or whatever. It's, it's more, it's, it's what this gentleman was just talking about. When I was a child, in my family, I was told multiple times, children are seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. Anybody else uh, mm -hmm. experience yeah. that? Yeah. My parents went to and that is, school, that right? is not <laughs> functional for the child because I, I, I learned to be dysfunctional as an adult and I'm still struggling with that. Right. So children and all people need to be seen and heard. Not necessarily agreed with, not necessarily encouraged to do whatever, but just acknowledged. Right now I work in a nursing home. I work with people who are at the end of their life struggling with aging and no independence, lack of control. Right. They just want to be heard with whatever, the, even if they're confused, even if they're demented. If you just give them attention and act like they're a whole human being, yeah. it satisfies some. And it, and it feels wonderful for me because I can feel that I'm giving them that. That's a need. That's a need that makes you whole and makes you function as a, as, a, as a real person in society. Then you can go for the cup of coffee. If you don't have that, screw the coffee. I don't even want the coffee if I don't get those kinds of needs met. Okay. I, I think there's a fine line distinction between need and want here. I understand what you're saying, and, uh, but I also could say that I want support rather than I just need support. I mean, there's a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the main point I was trying to make was that we can make requests without feeling guilty, without feeling like we're imposing people, because why? When you make requests, you're always open to no. Yeah, exactly. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're open. You're, if you're not open to no, you're not making a request, you're making a demand. And then you leave yourself up to be disappointed and angry and so forth, okay? And sometimes it's even helpful to tell a person, you know, no, you can't say no. I'm yeah, just right. asking. But if I don't ask, I, you don't have an opportunity to say yes or right. no. Yes. And that often is, <coughs> helps people well, to... One, one of the ways that we manipulate people is by our use of words. And uh, things like, uh, 
I need more than one over here, so I don't <laughs> need to keep going back and forth. All right. Okay. Uh, language can be manipulated. Anybody ever say that? Sure. What do you think about that? Don't you think? Don't you think? Yeah, I think. <laughs> what is it looking for? Confirmation. Confirmation. Yeah. Confirmation. Oh, don't you think? Oh, and if you say, don't you think? And you say, no, I don't think that way at all. It's jarring. Yeah. Because you have set them up with this, yeah. do not you think. You yeah. see? Yeah. It's not open-ended. It's yeah. expecting agreement. But we're not always aware of that. Uh, or you say, you do want to go to the movies, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> all right. So there's just all kind of ways to be aware of communication. Right. Um, Father, can I just, um, this is uh, kind of another word thing, and is that they had changed, or at least he had changed, uh, the, this um, information to compassionate communication yeah. for a while, and uh, now it seems that they're using this nonviolent. And um, people have said to me, uh, "I don't like the term nonviolent because it's a <coughs> negative, mm -hmm. um, and maybe com compassionate is better." Um, I personally have an argument to use nonviolent has uh, is a better known concept in the society, I think, and um, and it it I think it's more I actually think it's more powerful. That's my view, but um, maybe you could just say something about that. Well, for in regard to nonviolence itself. Yeah. Yeah. Roar says that that term didn't even come into existence until about 50 years ago. Right, that's right, that's very true. It wasn't even used, yeah. okay? Uh, so it's an evolution of thought, okay? Nonviolence, okay? Uh, what about non dual? Now, I was talking today about at, uh, at Calvin College, uh, non dual. DU, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Non dual and dual. Right. And dual is the kind of communication we use in every language. Dual means either or. This is either a, a table or it's a chair, you know? It's right. one or the other. All right? That's dual. Non dual is when it's both and. And this is when you get into your transformative consciousness and mystic consciousness and such statements as Eckhart and so forth saying that uh, you are not God, but you're not other than God either. Okay, now you, you can't deal with that with dual consciousness. It's not possible. It calls for the non-dual consciousness, the transform consciousness that comes from deep prayer. Okay? So, uh, in this sense, uh, I, I like the distinction that the word none in front of it means. So, there are oh, pros and cons. Compassionate would be your more positive passion. Okay. But none <coughs> violence brings in the aspect of this is a method to help you to avoid Violence. So it's you know there's different ways to point, but that's a good point. Thank you. Okay. All right. Expressing ourselves now. We had certain little formulas that I think are very helpful that we could learn. I feel because I need. Would you be willing? Okay. I feel tired because I need more sleep, would you be willing to rock me to sleep? Oh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, okay, not a very good example, but anyway. Um, what do you think of that, those 
statements. Do they make sense? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> now, how would it change if you put <coughs> the word that after feel? It's not a feeling. Feel that, is it? Feel that entire? I feel that automatically changes from a feeling to a statement or a judgment. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as I think. A lot of times you, people say, oh, they use the word feeling. I feel that you're not caring about me. Well, that's not an expression of feeling. That's a statement. That's a judgment. But all you've done is inserted the word that. But you got the word feel in there. You see how it can be? Okay. Because I need, and you have an argument you say, because I want, would you be willing? And there's your invitation, open invitation to yes or no. Mm -hmm. Empathic connection. When you see or hear me crying, are you feeling uh, sympathetic? Or because you are needing uh, someone to understand uh, where you're coming from? Would you like for me to listen to you? I mean, you could fill in the blanks in a lot of different ways. But this is just beginnings of sentences that try to get across this empathic connecting with people. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you feel anything about it that looks artificial? I don't know about the would you be willing. Okay. Say more about that. Would. Sometimes that's kind of a little connected to should. Mm. That's a choice. Anybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure I agree with you, Kate. How um, else would you say it? Um, are you willing? That's, um, that's oh, okay. a subjunctive. Yeah. Um, and if it, and, and I would say something, I mean, you could say, oh, are you willing? You could say that. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's, what's the other option? Would there be any significant difference in the two? Mm -hmm. I think, well, for me, I, but it, how, wait, the would has the invitation to consideration multiple, consider, to consider multiple things. Okay. R strikes me as you have to make a decision right now. Like there's something more point. imperative about the R than the would. The would seems to be yes. more open-ended, huh? Yeah, it does. In some ways it does. Yeah, I, I like that thing. Yeah. I, I'm not even sure in most cases you would really need uh, the last sentence there with the would or an R. Because, I mean, for example, my wife might say to me, uh, boy, I'd sure love a cup of coffee. Now, if I take the hint and go get her a cup of coffee, then there's no, of course, her husband's pretty dumb, so I don't always get the hint. But, you know, um, she wouldn't even need the last sentence. You know, I think she's, that's the point, that we don't assume that somebody knows what we're saying, so we ask, you know, would you be willing? So that way, you know, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I so if they don't get the hint, get the cup of coffee, then. It gives them an option. Yeah. yeah. Rather you know, than her sitting there waiting for you to get the Yeah, you know, it's, it's, oh, it like reminds me of the time when I was giving celebrating Mass in Lake Wines and giving out communion and <coughs> this line there, and, and all of a sudden this little four-year-old boy stands right in front of me and looks up to me and he says, I sure am hungry. I want to. I could have been knocked over with a feather. <laughs> I mean, like, that was a bolt out of the blue. I felt like saying, well, here, go ahead. <laughs> the parents would have said, no, we had not made a first communion. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's like a lot of people just want to have their request guessed. I sure am hungry. <laughs> and that's all you leave it right there. God help the person that doesn't pick it up. <laughs> I got cookies here. <laughs> but we're trying to avoid miscommunication. 
you know, I sure am hungry. Uh, that doesn't yeah. say anything about, are you going to get up and get it? Or you want right. me to? Or right. do we go to a restaurant? Do we go to a, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's invites, called clarity, right? It, invite, it invites dialogue, too. It does. It does. Can... The highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe without evaluating. Krishna Murthy. Mm -hmm. I love that sentence. The highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe without evaluating. Does it resonate with you or not? Not. No? Some people said not? No. Doesn't? No. Okay, could you give your reason why? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what they're saying there. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't know how to do that. Because um, you're always evaluating. How you respond if you don't evaluate? Can you discipline yourself to only making a red observation without judging? It's hard sometimes, but yeah, my um, We're, I mean, educator, and we're doing a lot of that in elementary school these days, where we're trying to build um, a growth mindset. And one of the ways we do that is by getting rid of words like "awesome" and "good job" and "nice work." We're saying things like, um, "I noticed you're working on the writing assignment." Um, I observed you um, going to the library and getting your research materials. So you're basically making observations using words like observed and noticed and just stating what you see without putting any... The good or bad dualism. That's, that's right. No, no words that because define it. Let me yeah. point this out. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we really need uh, approval, to that extent we will be devastated by disapproval. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even when you hear somebody else be getting approval, you sometimes, children or adults, sometimes take that as, oh, well, what's wrong with mine or what's wrong right. with me? If you're self-judging, mm -hmm. right? assume that it's not up to theirs. It's Right. It's creating layers. Yeah. Let yeah. see, the statement, if you approach life in the posture of a learner, uh -huh. well, you don't know what you don't know, and that makes us dangerous at times. Right? And so to, to observe without evaluating, you put yourself in the posture of learner to observe what's happening, to be taught mm -hmm. by what's happening, which the minute you evaluate, you, you've made, you become the teacher onto the situation. Yeah, okay. Now, for instance, a teacher could say, I noticed that you did not uh, try to be first in line. Okay, I noticed that, okay. And you could say, um, I like that, all right. You're not saying you're a good boy because you did it, or you're a good girl, you're a bad girl. <clears throat> you're expressing observation and a feeling. It's not a judgment. Does that make sense? Now, the other person may interpret it as, oh, you're saying I'm a really wonderful person, but you're not saying that. It's a distinction. I observe you doing that, and I like that behavior. What's the difference in that saying, hey, you did a good job? Being that's specific. Being specific. And that's... Mm -hmm. well, that's but even saying that's I like... That's evaluating. That's, yeah, it is. that's yeah, putting it your is. value on it. We wouldn't say I like that either. That would be on my no list. Yeah, I would say no to it. Would be. I think yeah. that feels yeah. like yeah. you're... No. Evaluating is not a bad word. word. It sounds yeah. like you're trying to make evaluating a bad word. Well, no... I, I would have just stopped at, I noticed you didn't yeah. try being first in line today. I, I agree. And okay. I would have just but stopped. But what's, what's assumed by that, noticing it, is that you liked it. That's okay. That's assumed, okay? Yeah, you still don't say it. I right. think yeah. you can at times. I disagree. Yeah. It still okay. feels like an evaluation. Yeah. Well, I like it or I don't like it. I think there's another point to that. 
if you interpret it as an evaluation, it will be. But in itself, it is not. I simply expressing yeah, my life. Yeah, it's a feeling. But, feeling. Yeah. Well, you know, I probably would have put a question on something like, what made you decide to do that today? Right, what were so, you thinking mm -hmm. when you did that today? Because that's what we do with a lot of kids with even a difficult math problem. Okay. What What made you come to that conclusion, or what What were you thinking as you solved this problem? So, and, and to me, it's me. That's where I might have gone with that. Is what uh, made you decide to do that I today? Would just be very careful yeah. of the word "made" mm -hmm. because then mm -hmm. has the connotation that it was not a freely choice. Yeah. You see. So I would well, avoid the word. It takes so much made. practice to get oh, every know. word, you know. So, so part mm -hmm. of it, you can ask a question that acts, that's more data from that child. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you could make your observation, and you could say, "How do you feel about that?" And it could be they're afraid to try to be in the front of the line. They could be because right. I don't yeah. deserve. You know, who knows? Right. And yeah. if you're working on some work, yeah. you can say, "I see you're doing. How do you feel about that?" So to me, there's a way to, to yeah. ask mm -hmm. and say, where, where are they with in that process? And they could, it could look really good. They say, I, I really hate how, I, how that turned out mm -hmm. because I need, they're a perfectionist and they don't like it. Where it's, mm -hmm. Then you know where they are. Well, like you know? the, and so part of it is getting more feeling out of it. What, you know, why are you choosing that or how do you? Okay, let me give an example here. Uh, Okay, so the husband comes late for dinner, and the wife says, I am so upset with you. You're always late, and you never call me. All right, two mortal sins. <laughs> you think always <laughs> and never. Always All right. and never. Always and never. <laughs> always avoid always and never avoid. No. <laughs> um, Never seen so, never seen what could you say in place of that? I am aware that in the last week, four out of five times, you came uh, late for the dinner that we arranged at 6 o'clock, and you did not call me. I'm aware of that. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with you not letting me know, because I like <laughs> to have my food hot. Yeah. Okay. That's good communication, because you are saying an observation, and how you're feeling and what you want. I want you to call me if you're going to be late. Specific, all right? Not saying, you are so damn inconsiderate, don't you ever <laughs> care about anybody else? <laughs> Do we fall into that trap sometimes? No, I would say it should never. turn them Never. Huh? <laughs> never, never. Yeah, right. So we're going out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that flower shop with my three kids when they were much younger. I heard my older son say to the younger son, Dad went to another workshop today. <laughs> good observation. Yes, good observation. Okay. Um, when initiating an exchange with others, we want to begin with a very specific observation about what the other person is doing that is or is an enriching life for us. You know. I'm aware that you're coming in late and you're not calling me and my food's getting cold. That's the very specific observation. We want to leave out any words that imply wrongness and judge others. Like, you are just so selfish because you don't call me. You're inconsiderate. Uh, you know, all these little judgment words, right? And it just <coughs> destroys the relationship. NBC encourages the use of value judgments like I like or this I like this you know value judgment and encourage discourage the use of moralistic judgments. It's important to differentiate between the two. So what do you think is the difference between a, a, a value judgment and a moralistic judgment? Good or bad versus cold food or hot food? Would that be Well, value, it's hot or it's cold, you know, is what I want for dinner. Versus, you're a jerk for, you know, not being here on time. Okay. Value judgments. Jim, you've been reading that book. What do you think of this book? Um, well, 
a value that my value and your values might not be the same. Um, and I would even be careful when, when you said in the end, I, I want, I want my food to be hot or my meal to be hot. If you would put it in the person's making the meal, I wanted to make sure that we had a nice warm, I had a nice warm dinner to serve you. You flip that over in that way so that you're taking some of the sting out of the person being late and he might be more encouragement to be on time or at least give you a call if it's going to be late because it's really to, we, so that we can have a nice warm That's meal. That's point. You're expressing your feeling of love. I really love to have the meal really nice and warm for you when you come in yeah. and I'm feeling frustrated when do, you come do you in think, Do you think, calling? and then follow it up by the request, do you, do yeah. you think that would... Would you mind calling would me? Would you mind calling me? You or, you're going to would be that late? work for you to give me a call? Would it work for you? It's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, moralistic is, but it's, a lot of times it's culturally based. Um, it's really different. It's kind of uh, uh, stuff that comes from outside, not from inside of a person. And it all, a lot of times has to do with laws that are made in some culture. And so you're making you're uh, making that kind of outside law judgment on somebody or something. If you really okay, loved me, you would always be there on time. <laughs> it's a moralistic <laughs> judgment. <laughs> right. This is that's not an easy question, all right? Value judgments. Oh, now we got them defined here. These are judgments based on identifying the life-serving human values and needs that are met or unmet by actions taken. The needs for care and respect, for example, are common to all people. Okay. Moralistic. Moralistic. These are judgments that label people either negatively or positively. We make moralistic judgments to become difficult for us to see the human being before us and make compassionate connections. For example, politicians are self-serving. All uh, Catholics are alike. You know, all Lutherans are not as good as Catholics. So these are all, you know, values that modernists okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. How about as a value judgment? If I were to say to my wife, uh, I would really value a wife that didn't yell at me all the time. Okay, what would be what would be the mortal sin in that statement? All the time. All the time. That stands out because all they gotta do is remember one time when they were just wonderful. You see. Whenever you use never or always, you're climbing out on them and sawing it off behind you. Know? Yeah. All they got to do is remember but once when it wasn't true and they are now being misjudged. So if you want to get good communication, you want to avoid, I know it always makes your case, it always sounds better, you never respect me or whatever. You're not aware that you're setting yourself up, you know. <laughs> so I think the value would be, uh, I feel respected when you call, when you're going to be late. You're stating what, what your value is, and how you, how you feel valued. Uh, yes. Moralistic, it's more about, that's a you statement. You are... You people. You are. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Those people. Those people, right. Those inconsiderate people, right? All right. Feelings. Expressing feelings is an opportunity for us and others to connect with what is alive in us. To do this, we need to be able to differentiate between words that genuinely express feelings from other words that may appear to do so, but do not. Okay, the cause of feelings. Who's reading that? I'll read it. All right. We are never the cause of other people's feelings. Feelings arise based on whether or not <clears throat> needs are being met and the thoughts we may be having. Other people's actions may trigger us, but they are never the cause of our feelings. Examining our reactions when we are triggered will help us gain awareness 
and clarity so that we can choose to respond in ways that will better serve us and <coughs> others. That's a very valuable help. Very valuable. Because a lot of times we will say things like, you make me so mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? You're giving your power away. You have the power to make me mad. You make me. It's a, it's a misstatement. And it triggers from the other person a sense of being misjudged. Feelings are based on whether or not needs are being met and the thoughts we may be having. Other people's actions may trigger us, but they are never the cause of our feelings. We are never the cause of other people's feelings. That is not a generally accepted condition. Would you say that a lot of people think that other people cause them to feel a certain way? Sure. Like my mother part of it. They help. <laughs> they trigger. What's the difference between trigger and make? Sets off. It's just the last straw. Who's pulling it? <laughs> There's something in you that's being triggered. It's in you. It's not yeah. in them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know they're doing that. They're not intentionally triggering you. Okay. True. Right. They don't and you know. have to explain to them what's coming what's up for you, for you so they can understand. Oh, when I do this, you feel this. Oh, I didn't know that because of this and this and this. Right. Okay. It's okay. in you. You have no. to take responsibility. It's, it's all about it. taking responsibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. It really is. That's the whole course. It's about responsible communication. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Taking responsibility for your feelings, your wants, your needs, your request, whatever it is. Not blaming, not telling other people it's their fault, okay? All right, we're kind of running down to the end of time here. Needs, also referred to as values or common to all people. The result of needs makes them easy to identify. Example of needs would be food, shelter, caring, attention, love, trust, respect, connection, understanding, contribution. In nonviolent communication, we do our best not to confuse needs with requests and our strategies. Now, he used to say uh, not to confuse wants with requests. Okay, now he's changed this too. Anyway, um, if the accent here is values common to all people. We all want respect. We all want uh, care. We want love. We want uh, understanding. We want to feel like we're contributing, right? And we tie into those uh, feelings, this these uh, needs of another person. Can you help them to realize that you respect their needs? And you they respect yours. It's a mutual thing, of course, right? Request. Ooh, bye -bye. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly always when we're communicating with others, we are wanting something back from them. Such exchanges, it is vitally important to end with a doable request. We therefore want to have clarity and awareness of what specific actions we would like that might contribute to meeting our needs. If we do not end with requests, people can easily feel confused about how to respond. They may blame themselves when hearing about our unmet needs and think that they are somehow the cause of our pain, or they may blame us for expressing pain that they don't know how to fix. Either will result in further alienation. Types of requests, connection requests, action requests. Use of the words, would you be willing, convey to others that we are in fact making a request and not a demand. We're open to receiving a no and learning from the other person what needs of theirs would not be met by acting on our request. Uh, I, my experience is a lot of people, if you say something I really would like that, they hear, I gotta get it, you know, I gotta do it, you know. It's like horse and buggy, you know. As long as you don't make the request an impossible one to fulfill, like 
well, will you just promise never to be late again? Or it's much more open that you, if you would just say that when, whenever you're running late, you think it would be possible to let me know so I can okay. the next All right. Don't threaten. Okay. Don't just do something and be there. Do it. For the most part, empathic connection happens silently. The quality of our listening that creates the connection. Listening is a key, see? When we are connecting empathically, the words we use will naturally be rooted in empathy. Once empathic connection is established, and everyone clearly hears everyone else's needs without hearing criticism or demands, solutions reveal themselves with ease. Just remember there are two things to keep in mind. We are to enjoy giving empathy to others. We are never responsible for how another person feels. It is isn't our job to make the other person feel better. Okay? Um, a lot of relationships end up in disaster because uh, they have this understanding that it's the other person's job to make you happy or to take away your loneliness or whatever it is. Uh, and it's an impossible request. It's unreasonable. Everyone's responsible for their own feelings. You don't make someone happy. You don't make someone mad. You either meet or do not meet their needs or requests or wants, but it's all done with responsibility and without judgment, without labeling. These are basic communication things, right? Okay. Let's see. Let me just, I think we get through this now. When I'm angry, three things are true. There's something I'm wanting that I'm not getting. I'm telling myself that it should be given to me. I'm about to speak and behave in a way that will virtually assure that I won't get what I want. <laughs> or at least assure that even if I get it, will not be given in the way I want it most. You can watch the two-part course on that. Go to YouTube and go to look at Marshall Wells' record. He's much more effective in this than I am. This is his thing, you know. <laughs> but he uses puppets and everything. I'm going to try to bring some little tools next time. I ordered some stuff from his website, okay? So next time we'll have a little practice and go further into this. Hopefully you will have had a chance to read this over and absorb it a little more and, and come back with more questions, all right? There are a lot of YouTubes. Oh there. my gosh, there's a ton of them. Oh, ton of them. Are you going to be put on the road the jackal Marshall. and the giraffe? Marshall. Yeah, the jackal and the giraffe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great stuff, great stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I enjoyed thank sharing you. with you and learning together, because it's always learning together. It's not just here I'm the teacher and you're the mom. We learn together. It's participation in the search for wisdom and meaning. Right? Mm -hmm. Loving God be with us as we struggle to make one, to communicate, to bring about unity and harmony and love. Help us to learn the skills we need to be able to bring about this sense of unity and love wherever we are.